I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my are open we want to hear that story that great great story of your love for us it all began with love it still is going on with love lord we don't understand how much you love us we can't comprehend how much you love us some of us grew up with a lot of you know negativity a lot of condemnation a lot of uh, you know you're never quite good enough and uh, it's hard for us to believe that that you really love us so much but you do and that's a fact, and we believe it by faith, and we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face, and we will feel that love, and we can express our love back to you face to face, because we love you so much for loving us so much. Thank you, Father. Be with us tonight. Open our hearts, our minds, our souls, and help us to be ready to receive all the good things you have for us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. <laughs> Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes. 
makes me white as snow No other fact I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can foresee and atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Never 
light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. high every low no you never let go lord you never let go of me oh no you never let go through the calm through the storm oh no you never let go every high every low no you never let go lord you never let go of me This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my. This is the air I
I'm lost without you I'm desperate for you I'm lost without you Please stand for the last song. It's a song of the redeemed rising from the African land. It's a song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. A song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation Love song born of a grateful choir It's all God's children singing glory, glory Hallelujah, he reigns It's all God's children singing glory, glory Towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered in the ground. All the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. All the bells rung from a thousand steeples, not rich to her than this. It's all God's children sing. Glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all got children singing, glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. All the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. All got children singing. Glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory. Glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Yeah. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all got children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. Father, with all that's going on in the world, all the junk, all the killing, all the sadness, all the pain, all the blood, dead bodies laying on roads, never seen anything like that. It's incredible. We know one wonderful, beautiful thing. You reign. You are in control. 
and know our life ends tonight by bullet or by heart attack, we're going to be with you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, if we can make our way back to our seats, we'll get started here tonight. Blessed to see everybody. And uh, just keep us in prayer while we'll be here Sunday, of course, but uh, we are leaving for Mexico Sunday after church, so keep us in prayer as we're taking a van full of stuff, a bunch of stuff that Coley brought in and Barbara's been collecting and you all have been bringing in for Mexico. We're taking that all next week. We'll be out there. We're going to leave Sunday after church, so we'll get there late Sunday night. And then we'll be there Monday, Tuesday, come home Wednesday. And of course, Elena has a bunch of uh, our normal speaking engagements. I think I'm set to teach five times out there, six times, but uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy being out there. I enjoy the people um, and uh, ministering to the men at the recovery home and the women and then the leaders there at the facility and then even at Antonio's church as well. So I feel like we're covering a lot. And uh, so keep us in prayer, and thank you to those who uh, donated. <laughs> you know, it's, I guess I can say it now. Um, I didn't think I was asking for gas money a couple weeks ago on a Sunday. I just thought I was being a somewhat good steward by saying we're going to hold off on going to Mexico because gas is so high, and um, somebody, two people caught wind of that and came up after church and said, well, how about if I just give you money for gas to go to Mexico? And so I said, well, to me, it sounds like uh, God maybe wants us to go to Mexico. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to go out there and uh, deliver the stuff and teach. And then we'll go again, hopefully, when Barbara and Jim get back sometime in August or something to do. And maybe Maria and the kids to do um, the VBS kind of thing out there. And um, so we'll see. May. That'd be April, May, June, July. Yeah, that'd be four months away after that. So we try to go out there three times a year. I think a couple times we've been four. Um, but anyways, so keep us in prayer for that. And so uh, tonight we look at Daniel chapter 9. Um, if you guys are warm, uh, Phil, maybe you can turn the air, maybe set it to 72 or whatever's comfortable. Um, but uh, if... You brought your Bible with you here tonight, and you want to open it to Daniel chapter 9, as we're going to look at the second half of Daniel here tonight, and really one of the more profound, the more uh, very detailed and specific prophecies that we find in the Bible. Uh, Daniel is a prophet who gives us several prophecies that we've been looking at through the first eight chapters. But this one here in Daniel chapter 9, the second half, is phenomenal. Because Daniel, through the angel Gabriel, tells us a starting point of when this 70 weeks is going to begin. And tells us that there is this exact number of years and days that will transpire from this decree that is given until the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is uh, announced or welcomed as the Messiah. And so very, very easy for this prophecy when Daniel's writing it. <laughs> very easy for this prophecy to either be thrown by the wayside or to come to fulfillment. When you're talking about a matter of exact days, that is a pretty specific um, prophecy, because that one can get, you know, some guys can be very lucky, I'll say, if it's not um, a prophecy given by God. Guys can just take guesses about things that are going to happen. Well, I think this is going to happen 10 years from now, you know, and maybe it happens nine years or eight years or never at all. Uh, but this prophecy to be so pinpointed um, thousands of years before or 900,000 years before these events, what happened is phenomenal. And so uh, really encouraged. I love this, this chapter. And, um, you know, again, it just speaks to God knowing what he's talking about. That's all prophecy is. It points to 
God knowing things that we don't, that God knows the future, because truly a man could not get even close to this, uh, to be exact like Daniel was, is a whole other thing. So uh, we're going to look at this here tonight and pray that God would give us something special here tonight. So let's pray and we'll get into the study, Daniel chapter 9. Father in heaven, thank you again for another beautiful day. God, thank you for the sun shining. Thank you for the warmth. Lord, thank you for the leaves beginning to come out and bloom on the trees and the flowers and, oh yes, the weeds, my favorite. Uh, But Lord, thank you for replenishing the land, Lord, your earth. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would continue, Lord, day by day uh, to bless us as individuals, as we seek you, as we love you, looking at these examples even of Daniel, uh, who I would say was a man who always would pray the mind of God. He would always have the heart of God as he prayed and as he went about his business. And I pray that would be us, Lord, that we are uh, living in this world, but that our minds are not of this world, Uh, that our minds are in love with you and we are worshiping you. Uh, Lord Jesus, that we are um, living for a whole different kingdom. Uh, You are not here physically ruling and reigning yet on the earth, sitting on the throne of David, but your kingdom truly has come to this earth. When you came the first time, uh, the kingdom has been brought to this earth. Right now, you are not ruling on a physical throne here on the earth, but you are ruling on our hearts, the throne of our hearts. And so, Father, minister to us, strengthen us, encourage us, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on that day that draws near And while we keep our eyes fixed on that, what are we doing? We are occupying here on the earth. We are ambassadors for Jesus. That we are um, instituting your kingdom principles and, and way of life here on the earth now. And so, Father, bless your word. Thank you for Daniel, Lord. Thank you for these tremendous prophecies, God. And um, we just thank you because it reminds us that you are infinite, God, that you are uh, the Alpha and the Omega, Omega, that you are the beginning and the end. You are the preeminent one. You have all knowledge and understanding that you were there in the beginning, that everything comes from you. Uh, Everything is you in a sense, and everything is going back to you. And so, Father, bless your word. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Daniel chapter 9, we're actually going to pick up at 15 where we left off last week. As remember, Daniel was beginning to pray. And Daniel was praying specifically, it was a prayer of confession. Daniel, remember, was not blaming God for the situation that Israel was in. Uh, Daniel was not complaining and crying uh, that you know, God was unfair or that God was unjust. Daniel clearly understood that the sins of the people have brought these punishments, particularly them being removed from the promised land and being put into captivity, that it was their iniquity, it was their sins, because God had laid out before them clearly the blessings and the curses. God just said, here's how it is. Uh, Here is the truth, that If you obey my commands, if you love me and you follow me, you will be blessed. But if you veer away from my commands uh, and you don't love me, then the curses of these words will come upon you. So truly, the choice was given to the nation Israel to either love God or not love them. So all Daniel was saying, uh, what was obvious, that they were not loving God, that they were in rebellion to God. They began to worship other gods. Uh, They were going through these rituals and they thought that they were being protected by these rituals. And God says, you know, stop with your sacrifices. Uh, The smoke that's coming up to me is is burning my eyes. (laughs) Stop making these sacrifices. The sacrifice that I accept is a broken and contrite spirit. Uh, Understanding that you are sinful, that you need to repent of your sins. And so this is what Daniel's prayer was, is, is reminding God, you know, and as we pray, guys, we need to do that. We, it's okay to remind God of what God has already said. Why? Because what God has said comes to pass, and it doesn't change. 
So some of the best prayers that you and I can pray are praying back God's very words to him or, as we're going to see here tonight, praying back uh, God's character to himself. In other words, how God works through his people, the attribute, attributes that he displays, uh, that is who God is. And so we can understand how God works. We can have the mind of God, the heart of God through how he deals with people. And we begin to pray for those same sorts of things. This is what Daniel uh, was doing here. Remember, he was talking about Moses and, and the things of Moses. See, Daniel is praying uh, because he knows how God was relating to people. So he has an understanding of the mind and the heart of God. Because remember, God's will is going to come to pass. And so what a great way to pray, uh, pray with the mind of God. And so here in Daniel 9.15, we read, And now, O Lord, our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day, we have sinned. We have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountains. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. Verse 17 says, So now our God, listen to the prayer of your servant, and to his supplications, and for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline your ear and heart, open your eyes and see our desolations, and the city which is called by your name, for we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion, or some translations say mercy. Verse 19 says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. What a fascinating way for Daniel to pray. And I think we can learn a lot from Daniel's prayer here. First, when we come before God and we want to pray with the same mind and heart of God, we have to remember our position, uh, that we have not earned anything that God has given us. This is what Daniel's saying here. Everything has been done according to your name, God, uh, for your name's sake. Remember, even Israel, his people, uh, God put that name on them. What does Israel mean? It means governed by God. And so, God is the one to be glorified. That's what Daniel is praying here. Everything is for your glory, God, for your namesake. He's saying, God, in a way, we've taken your name and we've drug it through the mud, right? We have made your sanctuary desolate. We have sinned against you. We have made your name a reproach from all the other nations. And so he says, on your name's account, for your name's sake, right? Save your people. Have mercy on us. And I love another thing that Daniel picks up here. Very far before the coming of Jesus Christ, who is salvation, the Messiah. Understanding that God's good graces does not come to us by our merits. It only comes to us because of God's merits. Based upon God's merits. In other words, it's not man's goodness. It's God's goodness because truly man's goodness is but filthy rags. Uh, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only way that you and I sit here today and enjoy this relationship and salvation through Jesus Christ is because of Jesus Christ, is because God's merits. We are robed in someone else's righteousness. It's not our own. Uh, it is Jesus's righteousness. And so fascinating here, guys, this is why, by the way, when we pray even today, what do we always end with? In Jesus' name. That isn't to try to invoke some superstition, some secret power, you know. We can pray whatever we want and then just throw a little in Jesus' name on there and it's going to be done. When we say in Jesus' name, what are we doing? 
we're basically saying what Daniel's saying here. Based upon the merits of Jesus Christ. Right? We are asking all of these things and we pray and we pray and we say in Jesus' name because all of these things can only be heard through the merits of Jesus Christ. We can only come boldly before God's throne of grace because of the merits of Jesus. Jesus has made a way for sinful man to be reconciled to a holy God. And so that's why we pray in Jesus' name. It's based upon his merits uh, and his alone. And so I think in prayer... Guys, again, like I said at the beginning, we almost need to pray like a wrestler. <laughs> you know, I've been wrestling a lot lately. But we need to pray like a wrestler. You know, wrestling, you're looking for advantages. You know, you're, you're trying to anticipate and look for advantages. So look at that in your prayer life, right? Advantages, what do I mean? Well, the more that we know about God's character and nature, the more we can pray according to God's will, we're looking for an advantage in prayer. Praying back God's own word is a very, very powerful prayer. Why? Again, because God's prayers always come to pass. His word always comes to pass. His word never changes. And so when we have the heart and the mind of God, we will begin to pray like God would pray, uh, like God would want. We would pray like Jesus would say, um, always doing the will of my Father. Right, Because Jesus was in such harmony with God. He was God, but he was also in such harmony with God. I think that's where you and I should desire to be, in that same kind of harmony with God. In other words, every circumstance and situation, we would try to have the mind of Christ. What would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus have to say? What would Jesus do? That is having the mind and the heart of God. And when we begin to pray that way, that is very, very powerful. And so here, Daniel, again, in verse 20, is now still praying. In verse 20 says, Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, notice, my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord, my God, on behalf of the holy mountain of my God, he says, While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instructions and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the measure message and gain understanding of the vision. So here Daniel is in prayer, uh, really fervent prayer, you may say, like James 5.13 says about these effectual fervent prayers. If we know the mind of God, then we can pray effectively. We're not praying amiss. We're not praying something that God would never even think to do. Uh, we are praying the mind of Christ, James 5. 13 through 16 says that the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous accomplish much. Why? Because we're simply praying in harmony with God's will. Well, how do I know God's will? Well, the studying of the word of God and the praying will begin to give us more revelation. In fact, this is when Daniel receives this vision. Notice that last week Daniel was studying Remember when he was looking through the scroll of Jeremiah and he came across the 70 years and he started pondering and thinking about the 70 years. Here's something that's fascinating. Daniel did not receive any insight or understanding through his studying. When did he receive the insight and the understanding? It was through prayer. Now, we do need to study God's word, right? We study the word of God to show ourselves approved, a workman, uh, able to rightly divide the word of truth. But your studying of the word will fall flat if you are not praying before you study, while you study, and after you study. Right? God and his word, he's constantly revealing things to us through his word. That's why his word is alive. And so prayer along with the studying of the word of God, this is when we see Daniel receiving this vision. And very fascinating uh, vision also coming through Gabriel. And so here, verse 21, 
It said that while I was still speaking in prayer, notice he was speaking, praying, and confessing. And then verse 21 said, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, that's the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Now, some translations say Gabriel flew to him. One of the very few places in the Bible where angels are described as flying. Uh, the book of Revelation tells us that the angels were flying there around the throne. But here also Gabriel flew to Daniel. Fascinating picture. And so he had already seen this Daniel in a previous vision. And now here he is. Uh, as Daniel is praying, speaking, and confessing his sins, notice it also says, during the evening sacrifice. I mean, Daniel is just a devout, devout man, right? There were special times, just like we have special times. Uh, but Daniel's special time here was this evening sacrifice. Remember the evening sacrifice, uh, specifically the Passover, uh, remember in Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 6, when God was telling Moses to tell the people about the people taking the lamb, and we looked at it this Sunday, and inspecting the lamb from the 10th day to the 15th, 14th day, uh, and then killing that lamb on the 14th day at twilight. Okay, so the nation Israel followed this. Remember, they were required to give a morning and evening sacrifice. And so this is the time that Daniel is praying, confessing his sin, the nation's sin. And it's at this very special time. Remember even Jesus, how fitting that he would be crucified when? On the Passover, when? At twilight. We find that in Matthew 27, verse 45, because he is the Lamb of God. But fascinating here, this evening prayer. This was a very special time for the Jewish people, Hebrew people, and even Jews. Think of the days when they were living in the Holy Land, in security and safety. The evening sacrifice, they would be at their tents or their homes, whatever it was, and they would be able to look towards the temple and they'd begin to see the smoke rising from the temple. They knew that the evening sacrifice was going on. And so a very, very special time that Daniel is here praying um, seeking the heart and the mind of God with confession, uh, personal confession, national confession, right? And praying before the Lord, praying God's heart. And so what a fascinating thing. And so Gabriel comes to him, the evening sacrifice, verse 22, says that he, Gabriel, gave me instructions and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding again notice Daniel did not ask in his prayer for insight and understanding he didn't it came as he was seeking and knowing the heart and the mind of God and praying it was then that he was given this insight and this understanding in other words you may say Daniel was experiencing very close fellowship with God and isn't that true with you and I, that when we are fellowshipping with God is when God will usually reveal things to us in special ways. It's because we are one with God. We are on the same page. We are in line. We are walking in the Spirit. We are seeking the things that God would have us to do is when God will begin to speak to us. And so it's not just the studying of God's Word. It is knowing and it is praying through God's word. And so the angel here, Gabriel, says in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. I love this, that Daniel from God, through the messenger Gabriel, God is saying, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Oh, man. I wonder so many times, what would God be saying of me? I mean, what would God be saying of you? Would he be saying of you, oh, highly esteemed one? 
Some translations may say highly beloved or greatly beloved. What a fascinating title that is given here to Daniel. Why? Well, we know that he was a man after God's own heart. The way he prayed, uh, the way he was uh, seeking God, this relationship, this fellowship that he had with God. He was highly esteemed or greatly beloved. You know, there is another man in the New Testament who carried that title. His name was John, the Apostle John, who was known as the one whom Jesus loved. Now, isn't it fascinating? Look at this connection between Daniel and John, who were both called highly esteemed or greatly uh, beloved. Look at this interesting connection. Both of them were given the most phenomenal revelations in all of the Bible. The Apostle John, what greater revelation is there than the book of Revelation? Daniel, some of the most extraordinary prophecies as well. So these two men who are very highly esteemed and the beloved of God, why? Well, because I believe they knew the mind and the heart of God. And they did it through the studying and the praying. Uh, what a fascinating thing that those are the two uh, who are given this title uh, as the beloved of God or the highly esteemed of God. And it just always makes me uh, wonder and ponder, you know, would God be looking at us and be pleased with the things that we were doing? You know, to me, that's a motivator. It's not a fearful thing, but it's a good reminder and motivator to keep me moving along that narrow path because it's so easy to veer to the right or veer to the left or stop or run too fast or maybe even begin to take a couple steps backwards, right? So how important it is for you and I, I think that's where Paul would, and David would even say, Lord, search me, right? Search me, you know, and reveal to me my heart. You already know my heart, but sometimes my heart can still lead me in wrong directions. So God, you seek me and you reveal to me my error. You reveal to me uh, the things that are, are going wrong, those things that maybe I need to purge from my life. Uh, to keep me there in the mind and the, the love of God. Um, powerful things to pray. And so Daniel here, as he's praying, and Gabriel comes to him to give, give him the insight and the revelation. Remember, Daniel's pondering this 70. He was studying through Jeremiah, and he's got 70, the number 70 on his mind. I think it's fascinating that Gabriel now comes to him. And what is Gabriel going to talk to him about? The number 70. In other words, you're fascinated by this 70? You, you should be. You're going to be blown away. But let me really blow you away and tell you about these things to come that involve 70 weeks. So fascinating picture here. Let's look at it. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild, I underline those words, Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Verse 26 says, Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who, will, uh, who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Fascinating picture here. This is the vision. This is the understanding and the insight that Daniel is being given 
by God through Gabriel the prophet. And so what does he say? He talks about these 70 weeks that are decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, the 70 weeks, what exactly are the 70 weeks? Well, you go back to Genesis 29, verses 15 through 28. And we find that there is this same word here. That's a Hebrew word called Shabuah, S-H-A-B-U-A, that means these weeks. Now, the word Shabuah can be weeks meaning days or weeks meaning years. Specifically, you look at the Jewish culture and custom. They have what is called a sabbatical year and sabbatical years. Now, these sabbatical years were divided into weeks, and each week contained seven years. You can see me after church, and I can describe it a little uh, more specific to you, but basically all that to say that the 70 weeks represents seven-year periods, seven seven-year periods. And so this is what the 70 weeks is. And so the angel makes this decree that 70 weeks have been decreed notice for your people and your holy city. Who is this 70 weeks, this great understanding and prophecy going to be focused on? Daniel's people and Daniel's holy city. So I believe that this 70 weeks is focusing on Israel, is focusing on the Jews. That's what it said. These 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to do what? A couple things here. He says first to, um, first to finish up the transgressions. So these 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your city to finish up transgressions. Fascinating first thing that the angel says that are going to be contained in these 70 weeks or these 70 seven-year periods. First, the finishing of transgressions. Now this is speaking of transgressions themselves that is really speaking to a new order that is going to be established. The old order is going to be done away with and there will be a new order that comes in. In other words, man's rebellion against God is going to be finished. Uh, that man is no, more going to, no longer going to strive with God or God strive with man. The transgression is going to be finished. This happens in the 77-year periods. The second thing is that he is going to make an end of sins. Now, this isn't just speaking of the guilt of sin. It's speaking of sin itself that there will be an end to sin itself. Uh, the word here could even be that sin will be sealed up or sin will be restrained. And so we only know, we know, according to the book of Revelation, that the only time sin is going to be done away with is when Jesus Christ returns and really when this earth and everything is done away with and there's a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more sin and so it's speaking of an end of sins, and we know that this new redeemed world will be without sin. The third thing he says here is that there will be an atonement for iniquity. Well, we know that that took place on the cross. At Jesus Christ, when he died for the sins of the world, uh, he was the atoning sacrifice that his blood shed uh, atoned for your and my sin, or his death on the cross is what allowed us to be redeemed by God. Uh, the redemptive work of God uh, that we are now reconciled to this holy, just God uh, through Jesus Christ, through the atonement for iniquity. Again, a beautiful picture of Jesus. The fourth thing he says here is to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, this isn't speaking of an individual righteousness because there truly have been righteous people throughout all of times. But this is speaking more of the new order that would be brought in by 
the Messiah, uh, that there would be an everlasting righteousness. And we know after Jesus' Christ uh, kingdom here on the earth where he will rule with the rod of iron, uh, with that righteousness, uh, but truly there won't be this everlasting righteousness until all of this is done, and it will be everlasting. Uh, the next thing, the fifth thing he says here is for the sealing up of visions and prophecies. Now, this is speaking of the ending or the fulfillment of prophecies, the sealing up of these things, uh, the concluding, uh, the final events of human history, uh, that these are all going to be contained in this 77-year period that the angel is saying to Daniel. The last thing here, the sixth thing, is that the anointing of the holy place, uh, not the holy one, uh, the anointing of the holy place. Uh, speaking, of course, of the temple of God, and even more specific than that, the holy of holies, that place where the ark would rest, that was behind the veil, the most holy place. And so what a beautiful thing, the anointing of the holy place. All these things transpire in these 77 years year periods and so uh, this is what is going to happen and some of these things we've seen happen in fact all of them we have seen happen to an extent right they have not been concluded to their fullness that's why I said uh, Jesus Christ the first time he came here uh, as a man and God what did he do well he brought God's kingdom to the earth uh, and so some of these things have been initiated at the coming of Christ, but will not be fulfilled until his second coming. Uh, so beautiful, beautiful pictures here. But all this is contained in the 77-year periods. Now, what does he say here at verse 25? That he says, So you are to know and to, to discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So the angel Gabriel was kind enough to give Daniel a starting point. He just told him about these 77-year periods, but how do you know where to start and where that would finish. Well, you have to have a starting point. So this is what the angel says. This is the decree that there is going to be a decree uh, to rebuild and to restore Jerusalem and that it's going to be, notice it says seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. So from the time there is a decree given to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, there's going to be 69 weeks until the coming of the Messiah. Now remember, if 69 weeks are speaking of 69 seven-year periods, then what we're looking at here is 483 years. So pretty specific that he's saying from the time of this decree, you can go out 483 years and you will have the day of the coming of the Messiah. See how Daniel kind of put himself out there? God put himself out there. Uh, if the Messiah doesn't come in that amount of time, then you could throw all of that out, right? What an amazing thing. And so what decree, right? What decree was given that is the starting point? Well, very clearly it says to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. Now, there were four actual decrees during the days of Daniel that were allowing Israel or groups of people to return back to the Holy Land, to begin to rebuild the temple and to begin to rebuild the plaza, the moat, the wall, to build and restore. But fascinating that three of these decrees were focused around just the rebuilding of the temple. And so the first decree that was given, of course, was Cyrus, who was a Persian king. He gave a decree in 538 B.C. that allowed Ezra and some others to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You can find that in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now there was a second decree given by Darius. Remember, he was a Median king. 
Uh, Darius gave a decree in 517 B.C. that allowed Ezra and gave him permission also to rebuild the temple. You can find that in Ezra 6, verses 6 through 12. Then there was a decree given by a Persian king by the name of Artaxerxes. And in 458, Artaxerxes gave a decree that allowed Ezra to, uh, he gave him permission to have safe passage through the other territories, to carry supplies and materials through into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So those first three decrees given by three different kings were allowing Ezra and this group of people to return to Jerusalem, have safe passage, carry all their things to rebuild the temple. What does Daniel's prophecy here say? Uh, that this decree would be given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, behold, Artaxerxes, the Persian king, gave another decree in 445 B.C. You can find this in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Phenomenal picture when Artaxerxes was asking Nehemiah why he's so sad and this and that. And Nehemiah's like, man, the Holy Land, you know, my father's tombs are there. And, you know, that's our homeland. And God actually showed Nehemiah and his people favor in the heart of the king to where then the king would allow them to go back into the land. Phenomenal picture. But Artaxerxes gave this decree in 445 B.C. And it sticks out from the rest of these decrees, these other three, because it says that Israel is allowed to rebuild the city, the city walls, the moat, and the fortress. Very fascinating that Nehemiah is given permission and safe passage to go and to rebuild and to restore, I believe, is the picture, uh, Jerusalem. And so, if you take that date, right, because we have the math, uh, 69 weeks has been decreed. So if you take that date of 445 B.C. when Artaxerxes gave a decree to rebuild and restore that was different than the other decrees and you go out um, 69 weeks, seven-year periods, you do the math, it's 483 years, right? So you just take 69 times seven and you get 483 years, which... Daniel's day here, his calendar, was a calendar going off of 360 days a year. Not our calendar, that's 365. So you go and you look at these dates, 445 B.C., you look out 483 years later, which is 173,880 days, according to the 360-year calendar, and you come to the date A.D. 32. Fascinating that most historians and commentators uh, pinpoint the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in A.D. 32. A.D. 32. And we know that Jesus was crucified when? On the Passover. So it's not that hard to determine the month. So you're looking at April of A.D. 32. And then even on top of that, you have the exact days. April 6th. A.D. 32. You can do the math according to the 360-day calendar. 483 years from 445 B.C. when the decree was given takes you to A.D. 32, April 6th, A.D. 32. Pretty amazing stuff when you think about it. Now, some people say, okay, well, let's play with the math a little because maybe Artaxerxes' last decree in 445 B.C. isn't the right one. So you plug in all those numbers because the 483 is solid, right? 69 weeks. So you start taking these other dates. Some people say that it's the 483 years. It lands on Jesus' birth. Well, that falls short when you do the math because we know that Jesus' birth would have been around uh, 4 or 5 B.C. Some say the 483 years falls on the baptism of Jesus Christ there with John. But the problem is, is that the math falls short because that day would have been technically around A.D. 26 or so because we know how long Jesus' ministry was and these sorts of things. So the only plausible fit when you do the math, according to 445 B.C., it's the only one that fits on the 360-day calendar. You find it on April 6, A.D. 32, which is the day 
that Jesus Christ would enter into Jerusalem, that he would ride in on Palm Sunday when the people would begin to put the branches down and and put their coats down and begin to worship him. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, singing Psalm 118. This is the day, the day that the Lord has made, right? And I believe that is prophetic as well, speaking of an actual day. See, remember when Jesus said, that to the Jews, you should have known the day of your visitation. You see, God gave his people an exact day that their Messiah would come to the earth. That's why Jesus said, shame on you, because you did not know your day. You did not study the word. You did not pray. You did not receive the revelation. God was speaking of a specific day. Uh, This is what Daniel, I believe, is pointing to, uh, that the Jews should have known the day of their visitation now. Jesus' first coming was pinpointed and known, but his second coming is not. Not even Jesus knows that day or hour, right? Fascinating, but his first coming was known, uh, and it's definitely uh, knowable. But 483 years again speaks of that day, the triumphal entry, and we know Palm Sunday was only a week before Jesus' crucifixion. And so you see a complete fulfillment of what Daniel just described here in verse 25 so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes 445 BC to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the prince there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks which is 69 right 62 plus 7 69 weeks it will be built again plaza and moat even in the times of distress fascinating look at the next verse 26 says, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Right now, the 62 weeks before, what did he say? It was 7 and 62. And so we're looking at the same time frame here that the Messiah would be cut off, all in the 69 weeks that the Messiah would be cut off. And so fascinating that at the same time uh, when he is coming in on Palm Sunday, it was only a week later, the people were worshiping him, and then a week later, what were they shouting? Crucify him, right? And so you see the fulfillment of both of these, that he would be cut off. You know, and fascinating that the Jews can't still, still can't see that, that their Messiah would be cut off. Let me tell you, the word, the translation can be execution, <laughs> Pretty specific. Uh, the Messiah would be cut off, and we know, of course, he was uh, cut off. He, no one took his life. He laid down his life, right? He was cut off for the benefit of others, right? By his merits, now you and I can be saved because of what he accomplished there on the cross. And so fascinating thing, guys, these 483 years, it's fun to go and dig through all this, do the different maths, uh, and, and come out with that, I mean, it's just, it's too, too exact to be coincidence, right? If it would have been close within a year even, we would say, wow, you know, that was pretty good. You, you're only a year off. Well, these are pinpointed because we have some fixed things. The 483 years, we know the Passover doesn't change. It's the same time every year, right? Because God declared it when? On the first month, the 10th day, and the 14th day. So you can't get around these fixed numbers and then you just plug in these other numbers and you come to it and you're like, how did that happen? Well, it's pretty easy. God knows the beginning from the end. And this is how he tells us, rest assured, guys, even here tonight with all the pandemonium and everything going on, I believe God would be saying, rest assured, (laughs) I know the beginning from the end. Right? I, I know these things. I've told you about these things you should be prepared right you should be uh, not expecting in a weird way but understanding these things and so same kind of thing here notice it also says not only will he be cut off um, but it says and have nothing and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary fascinating That in A.D. 70, right after Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, we know that A.D. 70, 
Titus is the one, the Roman general that would then enter into Jerusalem and ransack Jerusalem, burn the city to the ground, even the temple. Uh, there are stories of all the people fleeing for their lives. And where did they go? To the sanctuary, the holy place, to the temple. And even then the Romans surrounded the temple and did what? Uh, set the place to fire killed everyone inside, burned the temple to the ground. Remember, they even, because there was so much gold in the temple, the extreme heat began to liquefy the gold. And so the, the Romans wanted the gold. And so what did they do? They destroyed the temple. They took it apart piece by piece, brick by brick, to get the gold, which, by the way, is also a fulfilled prophecy that Jesus spoke about. That remember the, when the disciples were admiring the temple and Jesus said, truly, one day, this thing's going to be leveled to the ground. And they were like, what? You know, how could that be? Well, that's exactly what happened in A.D. 70 is that place was desolate and laid to waste. And so notice, though, here's something important, too. It says, and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who was it that came in? It was the Romans. Now, this prince to be, he's going to be defined here in the next couple verses, speaking of the Antichrist. Here's another place where we see that the roots, uh, the heritage of the Antichrist may be coming from the Roman Empire. They may have the roots there because of this verse. It says the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the temple. It was the Romans who did that. Remember we talked about the revived Roman Empire, that last ten nation confederation that will be led by the Antichrist. Right? That's where we get all of this from. And so what does it say here? Um, the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood to the end. There will be war. Desolations are determined. Verse 27 says, and he who, this is the prince to come, not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now remember those weeks are what? Seven year periods. So he says that this one to come, this prince, this antichrist, will make a covenant with the many for seven years. But in the middle of that seven years or that week, he will put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on one who makes desolate. So... The conclusion of those 69 weeks, the 483 years till the rebuilding of the temple and the Jerusalem, the city, the walls, to the coming of the Messiah who would be cut off. Then the holy city would be overturned and destroyed. Now he gives us, remember it's 70 weeks, not just 69. So here is the last week, he says, uh, that there will be this firm covenant so this is the last 70 weeks of human history, by the way. We have not seen this last week yet, this last seven-year period. We read about it in Revelation. This is the tribulation period, that last seven-year period. And so the prince to come or the Antichrist will make a covenant with many for one week. Fascinating. When we look at First Thess Second Thessalonians and the book of Revelation, we know that that's what the Antichrist does. He comes, he makes peace with Israel. He allows them to rebuild their temple. He allows them to begin to offer sacrifices again. It's a beautiful thing. He's the savior of the world. And this lasts for what? Three and a half years. Because then it says here in the middle of that week, what's the middle of seven years? Three and a half years, which Revelation confirms to, gives us actual numbers for days, very clear here with the seven weeks, seven years, midway point, three and a half. In the middle, he will put a stop to the sacrifices and grain offerings. We know that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come into the Holy of Holies and he's going to defile that place. And he's going to declare himself to be God and to be worshipped as God and set up an image there of himself. And this is when Jesus said, when you see this in Matthew 25, to you who are in Jerusalem, when you see this, because remember, the Jews are going to be deceived. They are going to receive the Antichrist as their Christ. They're still looking for the Messiah. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, I just, uh, we're looking at solar for the church, something for you guys to be praying about. We got some estimates. 
Um, and the guy that I was talking to uh, said, oh, it's for a church. What kind of church? And I said, well, it's a Christian church, non-denominational. And he goes, oh, wow. He says, uh, I'm an Orthodox Jew. And he says, and as a matter of fact, in a week or two, I'm flying back to the Holy Land because uh, my family's over there and we're going to celebrate the Passover. And, um, but remember, it's hard talking to them because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. They're still looking for the Messiah. So how easy will it be when this one who would fit the bill, remember, uh, he's an angel of light, he's a counterfeit, uh, he will come and he will look like the Messiah, they will believe him to be the Messiah until he goes into the Holy of Holies and declares himself to be God. Jesus says, when you see this, flee. If you're in Israel, you're in Jerusalem, get out of there because this is the transitioning point. Uh, it's all the tribulation period, that's seven years, but at the midway point is when it becomes very, very brutal. Uh, we read about that in the book of Revelation. And so he will break the covenant. Uh, he will stop the sacrifices and the grain offerings. And it talks about these abominations. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, talks about the abomination of desolation. And so amazing stuff that Daniel uh, is being given by the angel Gabriel that comes from God. He's laying out this last 70 weeks, the 69 that have already been fulfilled, and the 70th week, that last seven-year period, is yet future. Uh, but Daniel, to, to get the precision on this stuff, guys, to me, is just encouraging. You know, I mean... Um, Having our sins forgiven and believing on Jesus Christ and receiving him as our Lord and Savior uh, is the best and the greatest thing that you and I can do before we leave this earth. But prophecy next to that, to me, is phenomenal. Because again, it just speaks of God being outside of space and time. And remember that, God is not confined by space and time. He sees it all at the same time. And so those prophecies are just evidence, again, of God speaking to you and I, uh, the infinite speaking to the finite, reminding us that he is infinite, and that he knows the beginning from the end. Um, and Daniel nails it. And so uh, I pray as we go tonight, guys, that we would just be encouraged and that we would continue studying his word, but also praying. Uh, hopefully we always pray before we study. And and I don't mean just, um, you know, throw up a quick one, you know, but really beginning to pray and ask God to give you revelation. Ask God to give you understanding. And then as you study, when you come across something you're having a hard time with, don't go right for the commentary right away. Pray. Pray. Why? Well, because Daniel is a pretty good example. His understanding and insight came through prayer. That's when God gave him the answer. And so sometimes God, we may seem like our prayers are not being answered or being delayed. And we see an interesting picture too. Sometimes there's a spiritual warfare in there. Uh, but sometimes I think it's just because we aren't praying and we aren't seeking God to give us that insight and that revelation. And um, so encouraging stuff. I pray that you're encouraged through it um, to keep seeking His face to remember that it's not our goodness. Uh, it's, we're not asking God to bless us on our good merits, like Daniel said, or our bad merits, uh, but bless us according to your merits, based upon your merits, God, your mercy, your grace. Um, we confess our sins, God. Uh, nothing in my life is a result of you being evil. Uh, nothing in my life is a result or your fault, God. Everything in my life is because of my relationship with God. Think about that. Um, we can't blame God for where we're at. In fact, we need to be careful that we don't start blaming God for our situations. Instead, we need to see them in light of Him. Uh, and what can we make of this situation? Because um, we know that God desires that kind of relationship with each and every one of us that we would know his mind and know his heart. And I believe we get that the more we study and pray and have that fellowship to where we begin to know the mind of Christ. That's what it's all about. 
that we may decrease as he begins to increase in us. And we are little Christ running around in this world, right? Christians, Christ-like. That's what it is. We're ambassadors. We're representatives. Well, how are we going to represent him if we don't know what he is or who he is or what he stands for or how he makes his decisions or does he love, does he hate, does he do all of the above? Well, it's right here. God's given it all to us. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What an amazing God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, again for tonight. And thank you for your word, Lord, that has been preserved. Lord, that we can each have a copy on our phone or in our hand. Lord, thank you that we are able to open your word and to study your word, God, a privilege that I think we take for granted sometimes. A lot of countries, you cannot be caught with a Bible. They'll kill you. They bury them. And then one guy sneaks out at night and digs it up and reads it and brings it back and tells everybody about it. I mean, crazy stuff. And so, Father, let us not forsake uh, these privileges that you've given us. Lord, let us continue to be good students and learners of your word, God. And we pray, God, that we would continue to seek you for insight, and for understanding, God. And thank you for the men and women that you've given this great, extraordinary ability and insight and understanding that have made it a little more simple for uh, some of us to read and to be able to understand. But let us not rely upon other men's interpretations. Let us check those interpretations. Let your word be our source of truth, not someone else. Let us go straight to Jesus ourselves. Uh, Because I believe that's what we are to do, is to point people to Jesus. I would never want to draw anyone to myself, because I will fall short. I will let them down. I always want to point people to Jesus. This is what I'm standing upon. It is upon the Word of God. It is upon the rock. And you, too, need to stand there. Uh, I can't stand there for you. And so, Father, bless us as we go. Thank you so much again for this day. Thank you for the provisions, Lord. Thank you for the way you supply every need, God. And and occasionally you give us our wants too, God. You spoil us. And so, Father, bless us as we go now. We love you and we praise you. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Beautiful part of the Bible. Yeah. Please stand. night. See you Sunday. Looking forward to it. Say goodbye to Michelle. She's leaving for a couple of months now. Wow.